Okay, I think we are now ready to start. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and last conversation for the future of Europe this year that are taking place this year in the framework of the Wednesday EGPP seminar series. For those of you who connect for the first time, my name is Lorenzo Cicchi. I am the EGPP coordinator, and I will be chairing this session. It is a pleasure to see lots of familiar and some new faces for the conversation led by Miguel Maduro today on EU taxes and how they can actually increase citizen support for the European Union. As I said, the EGPP seminar series takes place on Wednesdays over the course of the whole academic year and combines a different uh, type of formats. We have research seminars, book presentations, seminars uh, of the European Union Studies Working Group, which is led by PhD researchers, and finally, conversations for the future of Europe, which is the case of today's session. Now we are still uh, confined in our Zoom limbo, but hopefully we will go back to some sort of hybrid event with a combination of physical presence and online participation later in spring for the last uh, seminars. Uh, now for the introductory acknowledgement, I would like first to thank Bridget Lafan, who involved me in the organization of the conversation last year. And also I thank her for saying a few welcoming words before the proper conversation starts. I would like also to thank Daniele Caramani for hosting the conversation this year as a sort of a special event of the EGPP Brown Bag Seminar Series and also for accepting to take the floor for a few minutes um, at the end of today's conversation. I would like, of course, to thank uh, Philip Van Parijs. Now in the four conversation that I have chaired this year, I have thanked him for a slightly different reason. Uh, so today the reason is that he is already so enthusiastic and proactive for the organization of next year's conversation. So stay tuned. Uh, I thank the speaker, Miguel Maduro, and the discussants, Jakob Kepeller and Matthias Kamm, for having accepted our invitation. And finally, let me acknowledge the support from our admin and comms team, Martin and Sara, for the virtual logistics of the event. Now, before I move on to some more practical issues of format, timing, housekeeping, technicalities, I leave the floor first to Bridget for some welcoming words, and then to Philip, who will, as usual, reinstate the spirit of the conversation, present today's topic, and introduce the panelists. So thank you, Bridget. The floor is yours. So good afternoon, everyone, and it's a great pleasure to join you, albeit uh, remotely, but uh, we are, three of us at least in this conversation are in Villa Skipanoia. So the mothership of the Schumann Center is being repopulated slowly. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to say something at the start of this, the final uh, conversation for 2021, because uh, as my mandate as director is coming to an end, uh, the conversations have played a very important role in the history of Schumann in this period. They began, thanks to Philippe Van Paris, in autumn 16, and they were called the Salotti Fiorentini. And the idea was to have a, an open conversation about the future of Europe, big ideas, um, thinking in ways that were not part of the of the general discourse and because those original salotti conversations were so successful we decided that it should be part of the wider uh, schumann and eui community so beginning in 2017 we've had a season of conversations every year so this is now the fifth year of, of the institutionalization of the, uh, of the conversations and the Salotti. And I think it's really important, and I'm delighted to hear, Philippe, that you're already thinking of next year, because in organizations, institutions like the EY, where we all come and go, it's very important, in my view, to establish institutional traditions, but also to have the sorts of conversations that have been had under the auspices of the future of Europe. I think it's really important now, given that the Conference on the Future of Europe has been launched, but also because the EU is at one of its many inflection points in its history. So I'm delighted to hear that EGPP, that this will continue uh, after, uh, after I leave. I'm also delighted uh, that Miguel is giving, uh, my colleague Miguel Maduro uh, delivers this, not just because it's McGill, but all, Miguel, but also because I think the topic 
is really important. And I say this because, uh, to paraphrase Victor Hugo, uh, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And I don't often predict the future, and particularly not in terms of the EU, but I do think we will see EU level taxes over the next cycle. And I think that's important for the EU in terms of its capacity to deliver public goods, but also its, its quality as a polity, because uh, the no representation without taxation can be inversed, uh, no represent or uh, no representation without taxation. So I think that it's a very important topic, uh, and I'm delighted that it is how we end uh, how we end this um, this session. I also want to thank Lorenzo for managing the conversations, Philippe for for um, his intellectual contribution and enthusiasm, uh, and Daniela Caramani, who has is just coming to the end of his first. Uh, year as director of EGPP. So uh, my sense on leaving is that this aspect of Schumann is in very good hands. So I um, thank you all for all you've done over the years. Okay, I'll uh, carry on straight away. Thank you very much, uh, Bridget. And I must say, um, I, it was a very great personal pleasure also for me to start uh, this with you. Uh, it's to you that we owe the name also Conversations for the Future of Europe. You insisted both on the conversation aspect and the for rather than just on the future of Europe. It's definitely a better name than Salotti Fiorentini. And uh, so from uh, the beginning, so we had uh, really this conviction that it was important not just to analyze, it's important to analyze, but it's not enough not just to criticize, we must criticize, but it's not enough, but also to propose, to make um, uh, proposals. And these proposals can be bold, they must take political feasibility into account, but they must be bold, they must dare to be bold because it's the proposals themselves that can shape political feasibility. Political feasibility shouldn't be taken for granted as a parameter, but it is being shaped by uh, the, the arguments that come, the public debate, it, it's at least my deep conviction and, um, and a conviction that fortunately is shared by many, including uh, many uh, present uh, uh, today. So today we are going to discuss one bold idea that is a bit one of the pet ideas of our uh, lead speakers uh, today, but uh, an idea that uh, indeed for reason just alluded to by Bridget, has become uh, more salient, uh, hotter than ever before, if only because of this unprecedented, uh, unprecedentedly huge uh, recovery uh, package that uh, has been decided uh, by the European uh, Union. So uh, I'll let uh, Miguel uh, present that idea uh, in, in just a minute, uh, but let me quickly then uh, present our first, uh, our three speakers today. Uh, Miguel, uh, like uh, Antoine Vaucher, our lead speaker last week, is a bit of a, a, a home product uh, uh, since uh, he got his doctorate uh, at uh, the UI, as um, uh, Antoine Vaucher did, after having studied law at uh, the University of uh, Lisbon. Today is a part-time professor at uh, EUI and also part-time at uh, the Catholic University of uh, Portugal. In between, he was a strong presence uh, at the EUI, including as the founding director of uh, the uh, School of uh, Transnational uh, Governance. But he did also along the way and before that uh, many other things, including um, for six years as uh, he was the uh, Advocate General at the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. He was also Minister for Regional uh, Development in the Portuguese government for uh, two years. And perhaps uh, not least, he was also chair of the FIFA Governance uh, <laughs> International Football Association. He also told me that he has very strong, passionate interest for football at the local level in uh, Lisbon. Then we'll have, uh, after his uh, initial presentation, we'll have uh, Matthias Kuhn, who is a um, um, professor of law at uh, New York University, but also research professor 
at, uh, on uh, globalization and uh, the rule of law at the Wissenschaftszentrum in uh, Berlin and uh, at uh, Humboldt University. He studied uh, philosophy and uh, law and political science at the University of Kiel in uh, Northern Germany and uh, at um, Paris and Sorbonne before uh, getting his uh, doctorate at uh, Harvard uh, Law School. Published uh, many articles, uh, a number of uh, books, including one he uh, co-edited, I'll just mention that one, uh, called The European Constitution, The Rubicon Crossed. This was in 2005, so the Rubicon of the sea was not crossed at that point, and uh, perhaps it was uh, uh, without uh, being seen uh, to, I mean, something happened at that time, but perhaps not something as uh, big as crossing the Rubicon, but perhaps the Rubicon will be crossed soon. But this has been said repeatedly in the history of the European Union. We'll see. Finally, uh, Jakob uh, Kappeler is, um, um, did a master and a doctorate in uh, economics, and then a habilitation in uh, political economy and uh, the philosophy of the social sciences at uh, the uh, University of Linz uh, in uh, Austria. Uh, now, since 2005, he heads uh, an institute for com the comprehensive analysis of the economy at the University of Linz, and since 2019, he is professor of socioeconomics at the University of Duisburg Essen in uh, Germany. He published a number of books, so partly as an author or as, uh, as an editor. I just mentioned this uh, book based on his habilitation called Economic Change and uh, Change in Economics. Uh, he published on a mind-boggling variety of topics. I uh, see an article, Über Utopien, another one on the grants of solidarity, um, um, uh, another one on Is Europe, uh, Is the Eurozone Disintegrating, etc., etc. But the one that uh, attracted our attention is uh, one he published uh, very uh, recently with two co-authors on a European wealth tax for a fair and green economy, published by um, the uh, Foundation for European Progressive uh, Studies um, and the Renner Foundation in, uh, in Austria. So this is obviously closely connected uh, to uh, today's topic, but perhaps he will be defending something quite different from Miguel. We'll see. Uh, back to you, Lorenz. Thank you, Philip. Now for the format and timing, uh, Miguel has 15 to 20 minutes for his initial bold proposal, then eight to 10 minutes each to Matthias and Jacob in this order for their discussion. And in the remaining time, I will moderate in the best of my capacities, the Q&A and the discussion. Now, if there are plenty of hands up already after the discussion input, which is usually the case, I will open up the floor to the other participants right away. And I will group questions by three, so we have more time for going back on and forth from the two sides of the table. Now for the housekeeping and technicalities, the usual applies. So make sure that your microphone is muted to avoid background noise and remember to unmute yourself when you speak or have a question. And if you can, please keep your video on in order to retain a feeling of presence and community as much as that is possible on Zoom. If you want to ask a question, it's preferable if you use the raise of hand button, we should, should find at the bottom of your chat box. If you cannot find it or if it doesn't work, sometimes that's the case, just write down your name in the public chat. In both cases, wait for my acknowledgement. Remember to unmute yourself and then speak up. If you have uh, technical issues, open up a private line of chat with either me, Martina Popova, or the EGPP account. You have Sarah Bernstein behind it. And finally, I will send a private message to the speaker when he has five minutes left and to the discussants when they have two minutes left. So without further ado, uh, Miguel, the floor and later the screen sharing is yours. Thank you, Lorenzo. And, and first, let me say it's, it's great to see so many familiar faces, even if unfortunately uh, um, in this virtual format. Um, uh, it will be much nicer to be in Florence um, doing this. 
Uh, and let me start by thanking Bridget and Philip for, for the invitation and also um, Matthias, who is a long uh, time friend and colleague and with whom I share a lot of opinions on many issues. Um, and uh, Jacob, whom I don't know, but I'm very eager to, to find uh, what he thinks about these proposals. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that, uh, uh, that my proposal is uh, less bold now than it was 10 years ago when it was first presented. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I remember when I first presented um, a kind of a sketch uh, uh, a long, in a rep long report to the European Parliament uh, that it was labeled in many places, including in a conference that was organized in Florence um, at the time of the crisis of 2011, as something impossible, not even worth discussing. Uh, uh, three years ago, I was in the European Parliament, again invited to revisit the proposal, and it was no longer impossible, it was unlikely unlikely so and now it does seem possible so it does tells us that things do progress and things that may start by looking impossible uh, uh, may turn out to actually be possible and that's i think it's the value of bold proposals as philip was saying is that they uh, they set a vision they set they, they help shape the discourse and you may not end up exactly with what uh, is, is uh, our original proposals but they may help um, lead the, the discourse and the public discourse and then public policies in the in the right direction and i hope that is the case now uh, um the issue of own resources had been and has been on the table including the possibility of eu taxes well before uh, uh, the proposal i made in that report to the european parliament of 2011. Uh, what i think if i may have a merit in that respect was the way I approached the, the issue of own resources that often uh, have, be, have been addressed and have, continue to be addressed in many circles, uh, mostly as an instrumental question. Uh, how can the European Union uh, gather the resources necessary for the policies uh, that it needs to implement or the goals it wants to pursue? Uh, 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 and the link between own resources and the legitimacy uh, and even the support for the European Union is often not elaborated, not dealt with. On, on the contrary, uh, legitimacy issues uh, are often addressed as a limit to the scope and type of, type of resources the Union can get, and not the other way around. And what I basically tried to do was to reverse this discussion and argue that actually own resources should primarily be constructed in light of the need for legitimacy on the part of the European Union. Now, in order to do this, uh, I started by trying to deconstruct uh, um, what is the usual criticism of the European Union and its lack of legitimacy, that it does not answer to the needs of its citizens, does not hear what is citizens, there's not sufficient participation on the part of the citizens. Uh, uh, and, and, and the way this popular representation of Europe's legitimacy problems, uh, if we can define it that way, can be linked to the traditional concepts of output and input legitimacy. Um, uh, output legitimacy focusing, as all of you know, on the results achieved or not by the European Union, in other words, what it offers to citizens. Um, and it is often said that the Union uh, no longer deliver on results as it used to do, and therefore it's losing its output legitimacy and input legitimacy instead regards the forms of voice that citizens are offered in the EU uh, political processes. And it is argued for a long time that the European Union does not provide an adequate model of democratic participation and instead in, uh, challenges the democratic participation that used to be possible at national le uh, level. Uh, my argument was therefore to start by deconstructing this and uh, saying the problem that the European Union is less about being responsive to, responsive to citizens and more linked to how difficult it has become to reconcile the different preferences of EU citizens. In other way, that the problem uh, uh, is less, uh, is more about the nature of the political space that has become necessary at EU level and the fact that this political space is not capable to reconcile different preferences of EU citizens. And I argue that these democratic problems of the Union 
uh, can best be reconstructed along three elements, uh, all of which, and this is the element that connects it uh, with today's topic, uh, can be strongly connection with the issue of own resources. Now, the first problem uh, is a lack of political internalization of the consequences of interdependence. That is, national politics has not much social and economic interdependence development beyond the states. This generates an asymmetry between national politics and EU politics and policies. Um, I won't develop this because this is not the topic of today, but this is one of the elements that I identify. The second one is the political gap between the expectations that the European Union generates and the instruments that the Union has to match the expectations that it generates. And third, uh, the fact that the, uh, European integration has increasingly developed as, an zero, uh, uh, as a zero sum and externalities game between member states. And this focus on uh, the, pro the entire discussion around the European Union on net national balances, this hinders legitimacy, limits the possibility for solidarity functions, and limits the possible added value of EU policies. Now, my argument is that the way the resources of the European Union are organized actually exacerbate these problems instead of helping to solve them. Uh, uh, in other way, uh, 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 the fact that the European Union uh, is mostly funded through transfers from national budgets exacerbates uh, this zero-sum uh, uh, discussion around the European Union, this net balances perspectives, it hinders also the capacity for citizens to better understand what is the added value of the European Union. In other words, funding the European Union through national transfers both makes it harder for the European Union, the European citizens to understand what they what the union actually is about and what they get from the European Union. Uh, so it hinders their democratic cognition of the European Union and at the same time promotes a zero sum approach to European integration and that focuses on uh, on national balances. Instead, we need from my point of view to achieve three things with uh, own resources and EU taxes in respect in that respect that that's what I think that they will help to pursue. First, uh, we need to uh, legitimate uh, um, the uh, the the expenditure of the European Union, including the solidarity that may link to it, but also all the policies that the Union pursues to wealth that is generated by European integration and not to the wealth of some states. To the extent that the European Union is funded through budgets or through transfers from national budgets, it will seem that uh, it is the wealth that is created by states that is funding EU, EU policies, including in its solidarity dimension, but also in other, in other areas, and not that it is wealth that is generated uh, uh, um, by the European Union itself. Uh, I would say that the idea that the European Union is an instrument to transfer the wealth of some states to other states is the poisonous tree that undermines, for example, solidarity within the European Union. We must detach EU policies and financial solidarity from financial transfers between uh, member states. Uh, uh, EU policies funding solidarity within the European Union should be a product of the wealth that the process of European integration itself uh, uh, produces and generates. The second uh, uh, goal to be achieved is to use EU taxes to actually improve the democratic cognition of the European Union. That is, we can organize EU taxes in such a way that these taxes make it clear for citizens to understand what the European Union does and what they can actually, what they actually get from the European Union and the added value that they can do with it. And I'll try to explain why. And third, we need to use own resources to correct imbalances in the social contract that are generated by the interplay between globalization and the digital transformation of societies. In other words, 
we need to use EU taxes to correct areas where uh, uh, um, social justice is no longer able to be achieved at the national level, where a fair tax burden is no longer able to be achieved at the national level. It is in this light that the choice of EU own resources uh, should focus on areas that will perform these functions. And in my view, what are those areas? That is, where should we tax? Where should EU taxes focus in order to perform these three functions that I mentioned, and that will help increase support for the European Union and the legitimacy of the European Union? They should focus on economic activity that is made possible by the internal market. Therefore, at the same time, highlighting to citizens the wealth that is being generated by the internal market. Second, economic activity that while taking place in a state as important externalities in other member states. Think about the environment, for example. And third, economic activity that states can no longer individually effectively regulate and tax on their own. Uh, think digital economy to a large extent. And here, let me note an historical point. Uh, it was exactly this third purpose that justify and led introduction of federal taxes in the United States. Uh, it is very interesting and a paradox that is not very often uh, noticed that while the American Revolution and independence was uh, uh, generated for a fight against tax, it, it, it uh, uh, soon led to the introduction of federal taxes. And the reason for that it, it was actually that they were the introduction of federal taxes in the United States were presented as a way to lower the tax burden for most people in all the states by empowering federal governments to levy taxes on merchants who were benefiting from foreign shopping and tax competition in ports in the United States. And therefore, it, it, the introduction of federal taxes in the United States was seen as a way of correcting this, uh, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this imbalance in the tax burden, whereby merchants were avoiding to pay basically taxes, and that required imposing higher taxes on the rest of society in all the states. So this is, in my view, also an opportunity that presents itself to the European Union at the moment. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why uh, times may actually now be mature, for example, in terms of the digital tax or CO2 tax uh, um, to introduce own resources. In addition, uh, uh, um, the way such EU, over, uh, EU taxes should be designed must take into account who benefits most from European integration. And, and, and finally, a EU budget funded by own resources as the advantage of limiting the cross liability among member states, limiting moral risk perceptions and constitutional limits. And let me explain this. Uh, if, uh, and this is one of the reasons why actually together with George Papa Constantino there to, at the School of Transnational Government and, and, uh, and Carlos Closa, we did a paper right at the start of this crisis of the pandemic, where we argue for a model that ended up being very close to the model that was adopted to fund the recovery package of the European Union. Not a mutualization of national debts, um, the famous corona bonds that were discussed, but instead we argued for the issuing of EU debt to be supported on the basis of new own resources, new EU taxes. And why? Uh, uh, because this, even in terms of constitutional law and for constitutional courts, as a German constitutional court, in our view, limits the extent of liability that citizens of one state have to other states. Basically, uh, uh, um, our obligations, the obligations of citizens on each member state towards the other states in terms of solidarity and in terms including of, of debt, are limited to what they will have to contribute in terms of own resources. That is clearly defined. Uh, they are not contingent. Uh, they do not depend on decisions that the other states may take. Uh, once each citizen contributes 
in terms of taxes to the European Union, that's the extent of the liability that they have. And that's therefore the extent of the liability of each national political community towards the European Union itself. This, in our view, uh, um, both uh, uh, limits moral hazard and uh, helps overcome constitutional limits. So um, in, uh, uh, in the State of the Union of uh, some years ago, uh, organized at, at the UI, uh, I conducted a survey with YouGov that was basically aimed at testing the extent to which this hypothesis, that is that uh, if we change the way the European Union fund itself, and if we organize uh, EU funding in terms of EU taxes that fit the criteria that I uh, developed and presented, if that will actually shift the way citizens uh, will be willing to support the funding of the European Union and willing to support the European Union in general. And interestingly, the results of this survey seem to support this thesis. And that's what I want to uh, share now with you. It's the results of that survey it has already some years, but I think they remain largely um, the same. So, okay. I think you're seeing it now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this was done in 10 states at the time. It still included UK, Great Britain, Britain as you got said. Nowadays, uh, no, it was the last year that actually the UK was uh, was part um, of that. And we started by asking citizens in those 10 member states that are largely represented of East, West, North, South, uh, um, uh, if they thought that basically uh, 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 the European Union should get more money and their state's budgets to get less money or the other way around. If they want more money raised and spent by member states and less money raised and spent by the, the European Union. And you can see that there, that if you put the question in those terms, you have a very strong divergence along lines that are not fully surprising. States in Southern Europe tend to be more favorable to the Union budget getting more money even at the expense of lower national budgets uh, because they see themselves as potentially benefiting more from the EU budget and you see in the north uh, uh, states uh, 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 more the other way uh, uh, around though you also see a large degree of unknown of don't know uh, in in a lot of member states okay so many people but so uh, i would think that uh, this, uh, the question put in these simple terms and on the assumption of the current way that the EU budget is funded basically reflects what will be our own assumptions regarding the reactions towards more or uh, a higher or lower EU budget, uh, 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 depending on whether citizens in those states see themselves as net beneficiaries or net contributors to the current EU budget, budget based on national transfers. But this changes substantially if we put the question in terms of EU taxes and in terms of support for EU taxes. And so, um, so if we, we ask, for example, and this is some of the taxes that I was proposing in my, uh, in my report, then I can present better if you want the reason for some of these taxes and why these they fit the different three categories that I mentioned. That is taxing the economic activity that is made possible uh, 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 by uh, the European internal market, uh, uh, taxing uh, uh, economic activity that is linked to externalities between states, and third, taxing economic activity that states can no longer effectively tax on their own and therefore correcting basically uh, 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 um, uh, a current imbalance on the tax, on the way the tax burden is distributed at national level. So, for example, uh, uh, you have a support and a wide support for a EU because we were asking for a EU, and that's we were asking for a EU tax on carbon emissions uh, uh, by businesses. Overwhelming tax support, uh, support in all the states. Uh, uh, the same 
uh, uh, on the digital tax. Overwhelming support in all the states. Uh, also, though not as strong, in terms of a financial transactions tax. Okay. Uh, this is probably the one where you have a, a, a slight, uh, um, uh, in one or two states, some hesitation about it, but Sweden is the only one that you have Sweden that where there's a slight majority against a tax on financial tra transactions, all the other states support it. Curiously, uh, 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 um, very strong support too for a tax on business profits, a EU tax. Let me repeat, we're talking about the EU corporate tax, not a national corporate tax, not an harmonization of national corporate taxes. There is wide support for a EU corporate tax with exception of Scandinavian countries, but even there, it's quite, it's quite balanced. And this, is what, this was one of the proposals that I had put forward. Uh, uh, it was the introduction of a, a, a EU surtax on corporations. Uh, uh, so not a replacement, not national corporate tax, but a small surtax on corporations that moreover, it was one of my proposals, will serve to replace the need for harmonization. The idea was, let's give up on the idea that we can harmonize national corporate taxes. So let states continue to compete, but let's regulate that, competi that competition, that regulatory tax competition by introduce introducing a EU corporate tax that the European Union could use to guarantee that independently of how much companies will benefit from, from tax competition between member states that has led, by the way, to a drop in 50% on average on corporate taxes in the last 20 years in the European Union. Let's mitigate the effects of that co competition with the UI surtax on corporate tax. And I also propose that this surtax could even, the, its revenue could even be uh, uh, distributed and allocated between the member states themselves and the European Union, dependent on the percentage of uh, income of the companies that will be linked to EU uh, intra, intra community uh, 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 economic activity and intrastate economic activity. So, making it clear that the revenue that the Union will get from this corporate tax will be the revenue linked to the intra community activities, to that that is made possible by the internal market. This will be harder to develop technically, but we can talk about it. I think if it will be possible, it will make it e even better. So as you can see, uh, 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 this survey basically supports the conclusion that I was trying to put forward and was the core of my thesis, that how you structure EU funding deeply impacts on the, uh, uh, on the support for funding for the European Union and on the legitimacy of the European Union. Uh, and if you develop EU taxes that make it visible to EU citizens, what's the added value of the European Union and what the Union and the wealth that the Union creates, you are in a much better position to both help funding policies of the European Union and support EU legitimacy than if you continue with the current mechanisms of funding through national transfers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miguel. Slightly over time, but nothing serious. So straight away to Matthias for the first uh, round of discussion. Matthias, the floor is yours for eight to 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I basically want to make two, um, two core points. Uh, the first is merely an elaboration um, on uh, what Miguel has uh, already said, and the second complements what Miguel said. So I'm afraid uh, if the idea here was to create a great deal of controversy, then by appointing uh, me as one of the as the first commentator was not a was not a success. Uh, but I hope nonetheless um, that uh, it will enhance and deepen uh, the case um, uh, along the lines. Uh, that uh, Miguel made. Now, first, uh, the point where I want to elaborate. Um, I think uh, the, one of the core points Miguel made is that it matters how money flows. How uh, it matters how money flows matters for 
our ideas about whose money it is uh, and what type of justification might be made uh, for it to be spent. Uh, so let me give you an example uh, from a different federal context. Uh, Miguel has written a, in part about the American context as a comparison, focusing on the 18th century. Uh, but I want to focus on a contemporary uh, German example under the German basic law, uh, relating to something quite technical and arcane called Länderfinanzausgleich. Never mind, you don't need to know many details about that at all. What you need to know is the following basic structure. According to these sets of rules, there is a certain amount of money that's actually levied through federal taxes, but that is originally by law allocated uh, as the states, the constituent units money. So they're being basically told you get a certain share of this money. That's, you know, that's your money. And then as a matter of solidarity, there's a certain kind of redistribution that then takes place with regard to that specific money, which has first been determined to be the state's money. Um, uh, and, um, and that solidarity is exercised depending on various basic needs and uh, et cetera uh, of, the, of the various uh, states. And so that way, uh, every year, uh, a certain amount of money goes uh, from Bavaria into this pot, which is then allocated uh, for Berlin, uh, or for the city-state of Berlin, or the city-state of Bremen. Um, uh, and so there are those who are net contributors, and there, there, are no, there are net beneficiaries, and there is a lot of politics, and a lot of resentment, and a lot of animosity surrounding debates about the allocation of these resources. Now, the interesting thing is that as a matter of absolute uh, volume, we're talking about amounts of monies that are very, very modest. Um, uh, and still, there's still billions of uh, euros, but compared to the, um, uh, to say, the federal budget, it's peanuts. Uh, even compared to the state budgets, it's a modest contribution to state budgets. But the point is, it's the allocative mechanism uh, that makes this a high profile political thing. Uh, and it's a high profile uh, political issue that, that basically pits one state against the other. There are, these, there are those that are doing a good job and acting very responsibly and there are others who don't get their act together and who therefore have demands of, on, make demands of solidarity on the others, et cetera. And there's of course, and, and so there's a sense that money that really belongs to one state uh, is, is paid to others because there's something about them um, that uh, makes them on the one hand deserving, but on the other hand, uh, they're also leeches that draw on the solidarity of the other. So that's the type of dynamic that's created. Um, and the interesting thing is, there is no similar dynamic in, in uh, the German federal system when it comes to uh, the money levied, levied by federal taxes as, and spent uh, on the basis of federal laws, according to federal criteria furthering the federal common good. So it's not part of normal political discourse that, say, the state of Bavaria or the state of Saxony uh, or, or other states ask, you know, how much money of the federal taxes actually come uh, from this state and how much do we actually get back from it? This type of calculation, this kind of state-focused uh, calculation uh, does not take place with regard to uh, federal taxes um, uh, uh, when they are levied. Uh, so, um, uh, so there is, with other words, there is a, a remarkable correlation. Uh, or there's a remarkable nexus. There's a remarkable way that the way money flows are allocated um, um, through laws. You know, there's just a law that says, you know, let's this kind of pot of money goes there, and then because it goes there, it's at one particular point. There's a sense of ownership, a sense of desert, and then. A lot frames, a lot, a lot follows from that about how issues of later allocation decisions um, uh, are justified. So that's kind of a just a, that's just an anecdote or another example from a different federal system that illustrates the framing effect um, that transfers that go from one political community to another um, uh, tend to have, and how they go away and how they don't seem to matter uh, once you have taxes collected. Uh, and spent uh, uh, centri centrally, federally. But I wanted to make a second point um, uh, that um, Miguel hasn't uh, focused on, at least 
Um, now I think he's focused on focused on it nowhere that even though he's mentioned uh, it uh, in other contexts. And there's another pathology, uh, I think that um, a system which operates the way that it currently does in the European Union has. So currently with member states making, that's the main part of the budget, making contributions to, uh, to the EU budget and then transferring it from the state uh, to the EU. And here's a weird thing. The EU does a lot of things. Um, and with regard to the economy, uh, there's there, there's this this apocryphal number that goes around that 80 percent of the laws made by member states um, uh, are in fact laws which just implement and uh, concretize EU uh, EU directives. Um, now that may not be quite right. It may be less than that. But there's no question um, that uh, the EU makes um, a great many decisions um, of great relevance um, uh, to uh, member states, and yet. When we look at the EU's budget, um, it is uh, roughly, it's a good 2% uh, of the European economy, which when you compare it to the budgets altogether that member states have, that's roughly about 46% uh, of their respective national economies uh, on average. So, um, or, or another way of putting it is that the overall budget of the European Union, um, sorry, there is only about 1% of European GDP and a good 2% uh, of the uh, European uh, of Europe's overall public expenditures. So it's 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 minimal. It's it's remarkably small. And the question is how can that be if the EU does so many things, if it makes so many decisions, uh, it has so much authority. How come it spends so little uh, given the role uh, that it has? And the answer uh, to that question is uh, that a lot of the costs of the decisions that the EU makes are borne by member states. Uh, they are the ones that implement uh, the EU decisions that build up, that have the executive apparatus uh, that bear uh, the uh, finance uh, and in that sense uh, bear the financial uh, consequences. Uh, in other words, the EU, this is now a term coming from uh, US constitutional terminology, the, US, the EU commandeers the executive branch of member states to implement and enforce um, EU law, even, and, sometimes, and sometimes this is quite an expensive endeavor. But it doesn't show up in the EU's budget because these costs are simply borne uh, by member states. Now, this is what in the, in the US is called commandeering. Uh, and which is deemed to be unconstitutional uh, there because it undermines democratic accountability and transparency, because the costs are not borne by the level that actually makes the decision. Um, and my claim is that we have this type of structure, at least in part, there are many reasons for this, I don't want to reduce it to this particular angle, but one of the reasons is that member states um, uh, seek to uh, in a, control um, uh, the money. Um, they don't like uh, the idea, or they didn't like the idea historically, it's been an issue, uh, for the EU to have its uh, own resources. And the costs of that is that they have to then, of course, um, uh, uh, themselves uh, um, uh, maintain the capacities um, and burden and, and bear the costs of implementing uh, EU law. So here's one of the effects one can predict that over time in due course will occur uh, when the EU uh, has its own budget, uh, when it has its own resource and it is able to tax along the lines in some way or another, as Miguel suggests. Um, and I think what, it will, what will happen is that uh, it will lead to the EU financing, at least in part with regard to some areas where it currently doesn't, or at least does to only a very limited extent, its own executive capacities. Um, so we can imagine that in the context uh, of say refugee processing or border control, um, the EU will actually uh, build up uh, more capacities and thereby allow member states to save money uh, in that area and take over uh, some, of, um, some of the costs uh, that are currently uh, costs of member states who are basically implementing and are being guided in what they do by EU law uh, in these areas. So um, with other words, I think, 
if we ask what's the impact of the EU having its own funds besides certain kind of functional basic uh, ideas, what is it? What does it say? What what are likely to be its consequences with regard to the polity quality of the EU? Then I think it will also have the tendency, at least, to enhance transparency and accountability uh, along that along these lines by at least limiting somewhat and restricting somewhat the practices of commandeering, which at this point are central to the way that the EU functions. And that too, I think, would be from a democratic and constitutional point of view, uh, an attractive uh, development. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Jakob, the floor is yours for again, eight to 10 minutes. And for the other um, participants, if you want to intervene, you can already signal that you want to speak by raising your hand or writing down your name in the public chat. Thank you, Jakob, the floor is yours. Yeah, many thanks for the invitation and for having me here. It's a great honor to participate. Uh, again, as with the other discussant, I, I agree with most of what has been said. Uh, so let me maybe uh, uh, make some complementary remarks. First, when thinking about the question, why do we need a taxation capability on the EU level? My uh, spontaneous answer or my spontaneous first answer is that uh, such a taxation capability would uh, represent a form of a much needed form of institutional progress uh, that is necessary in my view to develop or maybe even to sustain the European uh, Union in its current form. Um, why is that so? Because it would increase the autonomy of the Union and increase its political capabilities. And this is, in my view, necessary to end the race for the best location that we currently observe in Europe. And it leads, in my view, to fragmentation uh, and divergence, at least on the level of uh, socioeconomic analysis. Miguel also already mentioned in this context the loss of the corporate uh, income tax. One could add uh, the creation of financial centers that provide specific uh, regulatory environments tailored to the needs of business and the wealthy as one outcome of this race for the best location. And we have uh, to develop some means to delimit that. On the other hand, we need this political increased political cap steering capabilities uh, to create uh, in the much needed policy space to jointly address and confront current and con current crisis and contemporary challenges like Corona, rising inequality on the personal and the spatial level, climate change, digitalization, and so on. Against this backdrop, I would also argue that we need the superior institutional capabilities of the Union as a supranational organization uh, to confront the loopholes uh, that currently exist in terms of tax avoidance and tax evasion. And against this backdrop, I see a truly a necessity uh, to achieve in some way this form of institutional progress. And I would also argue that uh, it reflects some kind of good economic intuition of the citizens that they support uh, such taxation ideas in service. So there's definitely something to gain here. I would have to offer two other reasons that maybe go a little even beyond what Miguel has said, namely that uh, a joint taxation capability on the EU level would be a great opportunity to increase the progressivity of tax systems in Europe as a whole. So typically what we know is that redistribution in Europe is mainly happening on the side of public expenditures. It's not so much happening uh, on the level of uh, taxation because uh, if we look at all taxes in sum in the aggregate, uh, we find that the progressivity of these taxes, the aggregate progressivity of our tax systems is quite low. Finally, uh, I would argue that uh, joint taxation capability would uh, be a core uh, tool to achieve and contribute to what once has been called uh, the promise of convergence associated with the European Union and to achieve this promise of convergence without direct transfers. And this might sound quite general, but in my view, it's a pertinent issue because we are failing in this respect uh, in this convergence issues at least since a decade and we are failing dramatically 
Uh, so just to give an example, the simple possibility of directed fiscal policy in case of asymmetric shocks like Corona, which is an asymmetric shock, says it does not hit our countries with the same intensity, would indeed be a game changer, uh, especially when compared to the current fiscal regime, uh, which uh, creates path dependencies by rewarding the winners and uh, punishing the losers in, in uh, so the business cycle terms, hence our current fiscal regime pushes, amplifies divergence. So this is a short review on, on, on the reasons I see for creating such a joint capability for taxation. And you see this aligns, in my view, very well with what Miguel has already said. Another question that uh, is of interest to me is which taxes would be suitable for implementation of a, on a European level. Philip already said this in the introduction. So we have done a study on wealth taxation in the EU, and we think this would really be a core example also in the spirit of the arguments of Miguel. So uh, 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 such a form of pan-European wealth taxation would bring a massive revenue. I mean, it all depends on the assumptions you make on the specific model and so. But one model uh, I like, and I think we have some reasonable assumptions in the paper, uh, would create a revenue of 350 billion per year and only tax the richest percent of Europeans. And this already brings me to the second reason why I believe that such a, such a, such a tax would receive high support, because <clears throat> uh, there is a high and increasing wealth inequality in Europe. So according to our estimates, the richest percent owns about one third of all wealth. And uh, basically, that's why you can get a lot of tax revenues, but taxing one third of wealth means taxing only 1% of the population. Finally, um, implementing it you know, on a European level would, of course, uh, nullify some arguments against wealth taxation, especially the argument that it's so difficult to implement on a domestic level. So we have, uh, for most countries in surveys, very high support for wealth taxes and the general political rationale that is given why we don't introduce them is because of international constraints in terms of tax evasion and so um, Another form of, of taxation I would find uh, attractive to, up to some degree is uh, in the context of globalization. So we could ask how to account for lower production standards in other countries. I think the idea of a cross-border carbon adjustment tax is flying around, but we could also, of course, have a broader notion here that also addresses, let's say, labor or labor conditions or human rights or other environmental aspects. Thirdly, I would also reflect on the possibility to introduce specific targeted consumption taxes. So uh, a clear cut case that comes to my mind is air travel, but also in terms of uh, CO2, fossil fuels, much more could be done. So I would say that the current uh, emission trading system we have is not sufficient. It especially does not guarantee an increasing price path for fossil fuels. Uh, world market prices dominate the, the, so to say, our regulation in terms of net prices. And so I see here much scope for improvement. So that, that would be uh, my short ideas on how to justify and maybe also how to uh, design taxes on a European level. I think I have a minute left. So let me make one critical remark. I would argue that the discussion on taxes, which are paid by the full population, should be as diverse as the population who is deemed to pay these taxes. And so I, I'm not too happy that we have an all male panel here. And I would encourage the organizers to think about that in the future. Many thanks. Uh, thank you, Jakob. Uh, okay, so in this order, I will give the floor first to Bruno, then to Philip, and then to Calypso before going back to uh, Miguel, or if some of the interventions refer to Matthias and Jacob, we will also include them in this first uh, reaction. But thank you again to the three panelists. Uh, Bruno, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Lorenzo. And thanks, Miguel. That was really interesting. And also thanks to the discussants here. Um, the, when talking about European taxes, which is the expression you, you've used most of the time, there's two ways of, of you know, implementing them. One way is to have the taxes collected by the member states and being transferred in part or wholly to the European Union. They don't even have to pass through the national budget. So it's not really a transfer. It's just a collection that happens at a national level. Um, and then the other way is, of course, taxes of the European Union itself. Uh, now, the first option is the easiest one. And it's, it's, of course, the one that has already been used for the VAT. And I think there's just been a decision like this week on, on creating this new one, very small one, on plastic bags, you know, on uh, non-recycled plastic bags. There's a new sort of tax being created by the EU, but it's again a national tax of which the, the proceeds of which have to be transferred in part to the EU. So did, why is this an, 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 a simpler way? Because the, the other approach, which is for the European Union to have its own taxes, which I think basically is what you would like, has, has two, faces two problems. One is that you then need to have an EU tax administration as well, you know? maybe the European Union, the Commission and so on, are not so much looking forward to that. You know, they find it handy and useful that the actual rate collecting the taxes and dealing with all the problems is being done at a national level. And the second issue is, is more a legal one, legal constitutional one, is that at least some people argue that there is no competence for the EU to raise its own taxes. That's the competences of the EU is limited to harmonize um, national tax law, as it has done, of course, a lot already, but that there is no basis in the treaties for the European Union to uh, create its own taxation. So I'd like to, to hear what you, you think of, of those possible objections against the idea of an EU tax in the strong sense of the, of the word. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Uh, Philippe. I wanted to just react to Jakob's uh, remark. We are, of course, aware of the fact that uh, this was uh, an all male uh, panel. In fact, we talked about that with Miguel uh, uh, from the start, and we discovered it was not easy to find um, uh, female uh, commentators on this sort of topic. Uh, to We must say that this uh, all male um, uh, panel is a bit the, the mirror image of the fact that we started with an all-female uh, panel at, at, for our first session. But given this, I'll gladly uh, not ask uh, any question, and I only ask questions if there are no questions by uh, female participants uh, <laughs> to come and Calypso has, is next in line to start, I hope, a longer list of uh, uh, female um, uh, questions. Thank you, Philip Calypso. Hi, I, I can't claim to to re represent womenhood uh, uh, here, yeah. and I hear what you just said, Philip. I mean, Jacob, it's it's I, I absolutely always uh, a concern. Um, but I think it's fair to say that both uh, the Schumann Center and and Philip and, and Lorenzo are concerned about these issues. And all we need to know is, is to, to, to note them. Um, and, um, and indeed, in fact, I, I wanted to come back, Philip, to this very first uh, panel that we had around my proposal. But before that, I just wanna make two, two comments and then a question about that. You know, one is um, on the why. So we've heard, you know, Miguel, uh, a very cogent analysis of the why, and above all, to avoid the moral hazard transfer frame of European spending. But of course, uh, Jacob added a number of reasons, increasing EU autonomy, and Matthias talked about, you know, commandeering. Now, I, I would uh, add one, another why, and I wonder if you agree, which is that um, it would also allow for less need for policing of national budget under such things as the European semester, or at least less binding policing. 
because it would create a, a, a bigger capacity for macroeconomic stabilizer, et cetera, at the European level. And of course, this, this policing is a very big negative for European legitimacy. So I would add this as an added kind of um, reason. Um, and then the second remark is on to echo a bit both Jacob and Bruno on what kind of taxes. In terms of generic uh, criteria, I see two that are very promising, that are kind of implicit in your presentation, but might be actually important. One is to make a systematic assessment about what elements of these taxes crowd out national taxes and what elements are net increase um, uh, with a, a fairness effect. Uh, but especially this crowding out versus not crowding out, which is implicit in the digital tax, especially, but above all, Jacob's point about tax evasion. I, I would put much more emphasis on the capacity and the legitimacy of the EU to really attack tax evasion. And that's what's going on with the GAFA, but that would be very popular, uh, obviously among public opinion. So not, not all taxes are made equal. And the other criterion is of course, what is back to Bruno's point, uh, what relates to the current own resources, both approach and target. So own resources have targeted outsiders. We are a common market with an external tax. And it makes sense that the EU taxes outsiders. So the whole carbon uh, border adjustment tax, et cetera, makes a lot of sense too. But you know, maybe it's easier to emphasize those that are an expansion of the logic of own resources versus radically new, but maybe not. Maybe you prefer, prefer to sell it as radically new. So that's the two questions, the why and the why taxes. I guess there are also questions. And then my, my third and final point uh, is back to Matthias on, on commandeering, oh, otherwise known as unfunded mandate, of co mandates, of course, in, EU con in US constitutional discourse. But that relates to the question of the relationship between what we're saying with you on taxes um, with which I you know, mostly agree, and the spending side. Can we even think about the discourse, the narrative on European taxes without the narrative on European spending? Uh, what, it matters what this mandate is about to the EU. Um, and so you know, the, the, the question there relates back to you know, my own proposal on the democratic panopticon, uh, and the idea that somehow if there are EU, EU level taxes, the onus will be on the EU to be all the more transparent than much more than member state on how this is spent um, and, and along, along various lines that we can discuss. That's, aren't these two things, two sides of the same coin? So these are my three questions. As an EU I citizen, as much as as a woman, <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Calypso. So maybe we can go back to the other same side of the table with the same order, since uh, most of the comments refer both to uh, what Miguel has said, but also of the comments from Matthias and Jakob. So first Miguel, then Matthias, and then uh, uh, Jakob. I was forgetting to unmute myself. Um, uh, so I won't be able. To, I won't be able. To, I think to address everything, but I will address some of the points and the many points that I made that I simply agree with. And uh, um, and Matthias has made two that I agree. One I will just reinforce, and the other one I will complement. I'll do a little bit the parallel of what you did with my with my talk. <laughs> so um, the first one is on the question of commandeering and transparency. That's been. A, that, that's a huge question for the European Union that's been insufficiently addressed. It's not only the question regarding the uh, um, resources and how the Union uh, policies are actually paid for uh, and, and that they paid for often by the, by the member states and that, that lowers the degree of transparency. Uh, uh, it, it's also the case with directives. I mean, there's a good argument to say that the, the use of the directive as a legislative instrument decreases the level of transparency and accountability on the part of the, of, of the European Union has never been seriously discussed, but there's a, a strong argument uh, to be made in that, in that respect. There's another thing we should discuss, but definitely this is a good case for that. And, and, um, and, uh, 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 and the point that 
Matthias does is absolutely right in my view that uh, uh, um, that if the union acquire resources in this way, uh, um, that the EU could more easily then have to justify making use of these resources. And the way to do it is by fund its own initiatives instead of, of uh, initiatives that it imposed on member states to take over to take over that burden, that the way of justifying. So it is a win-win in that way because it allows the union to do things that are necessary, but at the same time, uh, uh, because they are necessary, the union can legitimate also uh, um, to do it at the national level by assuming the costs of it instead of imposing the cost on the member states. And the example that you give of border control of refugees is a, is a very good example. Uh, 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 I had at some time when uh, um, there was a discussion on the refugees and the cost on, on member states, the allocation uh, costs between member states. I had at the time argued that the European Union should actually uh, give uh, uh, the same subsidy with a variation to the cost of life to the refugees that were being allocated to the, to the member states. I mean, one of the things that made it very hard and difficult, made it harder for the Union to impose those quotas on different member states is that the union was imposing the quotas, but the member states will have to take the, bar, uh, uh, the financial burden of, uh, uh, of paying, of giving subsidies to the refugees and all that. And if the union will impose it, and at the same time say, and we will pay for each refugee that each member state get, gets, that would have made a much stronger, uh, uh, will, will provide a much stronger legitimacy to the European Union. And my, so I absolutely agree with that. I just wanted to add that example as a good example of how that will shift, will help shift the thing. And say that to a large extent, that was what happened in the United States in the, in, 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 when they basically, when they did that, when they uh, got the federal taxes, it went directly to fund defense, to take over the defense cost of the member states. Now, I'm not suggesting that should be the way we should use EU taxes for, I'm just saying that that's the way they justify the European Union. I just add an additional element, the complement to what Matthias is saying, and it's linked to that, is that uh, uh, the fact that the union has such a limited uh, uh, financial budget capacity, 1% of the EU GDP, as I said, 2% of EU public expenditure, also uh, leads the union to exercise its power only from the point of view of discipline, of stick. It's, it, it has very small scope for giving positive incentives uh, uh, with regard to EU citizens and EU member states. It always appears in the face of the regulator, the discipliner, and, 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 and rarely in the, e, 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 uh, um, with exception of EU structural funds and now the PRR, as the one that provides money, provides assistance and, uh, and all that. So this also, and balances the role, the role of the European Union as a political community. Every political community and every, every, every form of public power should have a balance between stick and carrots, between uh, disciplining and, and, and positive incentives and, and entitlements that it offers. And the union is unbalanced as a political body in that respect, and is unbalanced by, by that. So that will be my compliment. Um, Jacob, uh, 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 um, one question that you say, and Calypso also said and, and talk about, uh, is the question, I absolutely agree, and I, I made that point, and I cannot emphasize it enough, and you and Calypso made it, that the union, I think, could really have a very strong role here in terms of fighting tax evasion. So there's a win-win, because EU taxes, at the same time, can be presented as a way of fighting tax evasion. Uh, 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 and that's what I think has been insufficiently explored. And that's what I think explains the support that you saw in the, in the survey that I presented for all those taxes. And I think some of the taxes uh, uh, that you, um, uh, uh, some of the examples that you give go in the same direction and I will tend to agree with, 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 with them. Um, now, one of the questions that emerges is, and that links me to, to, to to Bruno's point, is that uh, that is a slightly different from the one of Bruno's point, but is is connected to that, uh, and also to something that Calypso said, um, 
is whether uh, there is a, there might be a tendency on the part of some member states to say, okay, we're fine with these EU taxes, but the revenue should come to the states. And you see that debate uh, arising in the context of the digital tax, for example, where some states are happy with the EU agreed digital tax, but they actually see it as a way, actually as an harmonized tax whose revenue would actually even come for the member states. So that's an argument that needs to be faced is why should these then go to the to 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 the, to the, to the European Union and I think the argument there is that who raises the revenue and who has the capacity to raise the revenue should get the revenue that's the first argument that should use if this is is this is possible because of the European Union then it makes sense for the revenue to go to the European Union but the second element is then to link it to specific public goods as Matthias uh, 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 was mentioning and Calypso was mentioning too. So we need to then link this. Now, uh, uh, Bruno, more directly on your question. I think we actually have three different options. The first one is that we can have an harmonized national tax that is harmonized at EU level, but whose revenue is then uh, 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 um, allocated to the European Union, only or partially. In the case of VAT, is partially. In the case of VA2, it's such a small part of that, well, it's a small, relatively small part of that, 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 that mainly still perceived as a national uh, budget. The problem with the, an harmonized national tax uh, do, whose revenue will still go mainly for the states is that you will then have a problem of accountability and transparency. People will not understand it as a EU, EU tax, and, and I think they should understand it a, 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 as such. But it may be possible, I think, for us to do uh, an harmonized uh, national tax works like that, but it is fully presented as a EU tax and it will be perceived as that. And if it will be perceived as a EU tax and the revenue will go to the European Union, I think that the fact that will then ultimately will work through national legislation and national tax administration will not be complicated and will not affect uh, the overall purpose of what at least I, I intend to do. So I don't think that that will be an overwhelming obstacle. This said, I still think that we could have a, 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 a genuinely European Union tax. And we could have a generally European Union tax even without a EU tax administration. As in other areas of tax law, why shouldn't we have a EU tax that is called a EU tax, that is, uh, uh, that is a EU regulation as a tax, so you may, uh, um, but, uh, but that uh, then foresees that the collection of this, this tax is the end through national tax administrations that may even get a fee for the collection that they do uh, of the tax. I, I don't think that uh, technically it will not be impossible to construct it like that. In other, in other words, I don't think having a EU tax necessarily requires having a EU tax administration separately from national tax administrations. You can have EU taxes and use national, as, as you do with many other areas of EU policies, you provide EU uh, uh, um, agricultural subsidies, and you use national uh, uh, agricultural administrations. Uh, um, uh, so that, 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 that should be possible. Another thing is whether legally, that was your final question, whether legally it's possible for the union to uh, adopt taxes. I've always understood Article 311 as making that possible. I don't see anything in Article when it talks that the union can set its own resources, what, what are our own resources? It's taxes for uh, duties, cost of duties, but it's taxes too. Uh, 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 I don't see uh, uh, anything in Article 311 that will prevent the union from, uh, it, it doesn't say that the union collects its own resources only from national resources. On the contrary, I think the text of Article 300 level goes more in the direction that they are own resources, therefore they will be independent from national resources that are transferred to the EU budget. I think the original intent of Article 311 and the original text favors the understanding that the Union on that basis could agree on uh, European-wide uh, EU taxes. Thank you, Miguel. We are already approaching to the end. So I ask Matthias and Jakob if they want to have a final reaction to the comments by the uh, audience and to Maduro's second reaction, but to keep it quite short, one to two minutes each. Thank you, uh, Matthias. Yes. So uh, what I take away uh, from um, the 
um, the remarks uh, starting with Jakob and then uh, uh, through Bruno, uh, Felipe, Calypso, and then uh, uh, Miguel again, um, is besides the core points that I think uh, Miguel set out nicely originally in the original talk is the following. Um, having For the EU to have its own resources to be able to tax itself is not only going to make the uh, the EU itself more autonomous, the way that Jakob insisted uh, that it will be, uh, it will also lead member states to regain some of their autonomy. Um, uh, so, And that will happen both because you'd expect at least uh, uh, you know, by, by a matter of degree, this is not an all or nothing thing, but you're going to uh, see a reduction of unfunded mandates uh, of, of executive commandeering. Maybe, the, but I'll leave that open. That's an issue we won't discuss here much. Uh, maybe we'll see even a retreat of the use of directives uh, so that we have less legislative commandeering, but we certainly will have uh, less justifications for the type of budgetary oversight, this is a point Calypso rightly made, that currently since 2011 and the new growth and stability pact and the treaty uh, and the, and the treaty that was enacted in the context of the financial crisis, which provides all these, um, uh, this, the European semester, the deficit procedure, et cetera, these types of things, um, uh, which are deeply intrusive and go to the heart of what traditionally democratic government through parliaments uh, was all about. This kind of deep intrusion, the necessity for that type of deep intrusion in national sovereignty will become significantly less pronounced. Um, and so in that way, I think, uh, giving the EU more autonomy through its own resources will, in fact, also help recover some level of autonomy, uh, some degree of autonomy uh, of member states institutionally. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, Jakob. Yeah, keep it short and simple. Um, my response to the no, to the remark on the tax administration would be that simply a tax administration on the European level would be uh, more would be useful in the sense that it's much more efficient than on the domestic level. So maybe that's not, that does not really confront the, the lack of willingness of politicians to introduce it, but still, so that would be the, the economic or, or technocratic argument. Um, second remark on less so taxation capability would put us in a position to do less policing in terms of fiscal policy. I think this is totally true. And I wanted to emphasize that it's not only in, in, in the newspapers and so it often seems like a question of framing. So who is the bad guy and or who is the worst performer? But we have to keep in mind that this has very real consequences as we have this kind of uh, negotiation issues on this level. We have the potential output model and there is a bias built into that model that simply leads to real economic effects that reinforce path dependency. And currently we are not in a position to repair that because of uh, political conflicts that would arise when trying. Finally, the most important point maybe was on uh, spending. Uh, I think Calypso mentioned that. And I would agree that the legitimacy of EU taxes would be strongly tied uh, to spend to how to the question how we spend it or how do we intend to spend it. And basically here I have to admit that our study on wealth taxation was actually motivated by another study on uh, the financial the investment requirements for getting a, a carbon neutral Europe done. And in our review study, we find that the European Green Deal is not up to the job. It, our estimate would be that it maybe covers a third of what is really needed for getting Europe carbon neutral. And yeah, such a wealth tax would provide another third, roughly. Uh, and this was a main motivation. So I, I would really, at, at least at the historical juncture we are currently in, tie it to these key future challenges that are yeah det detrimental. So that's it. Thank you, Jakob. So we are close to 2 p.m. So we can wrap things up towards the end of this very engaging and stimulating discussion. I would like to thank again uh, all the panelists and all the participants. And from my side, since we are at the end of the fourth conversation and the last this year, 
I want to say that it has been a true pleasure to be chairing the conversations uh, this year as well. And as Bridget said, this is really becoming a solid institutional tradition for both EGPP and Schumann at large. And I really look forward to next year. And I'm confident and I hope that the next conversation will take the form of a room crowded with, with bright people physically all present in a room here in Skifanoia. And we will strive even more for a gender balance of the 12 speakers of the four conversation with this year, we had seven male and five females. So we are close to 50-50. Next year, we'll strive for, for a perfect balance. And on this hopeful note, I leave the floor to Daniele first and then to Philip for some concluding remarks. Thank you again. Daniele, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Also from uh, me, a word of thanks. Well, to Lorenzo and to uh, Philippe, but also to all the speakers uh, in this season's series, so Calypso, Nicolaidis, Ulrike Guerreau, Antoine Vaucher, and today uh, Miguel uh, Maduro. We have heard a lot of uh, ideas for reform, and we had very interesting uh, conversations indeed for the future of uh, Europe. Uh, but also, obviously, uh, some uh, concerns. We have heard concerns about the feasibility, in particular that Europe is uh, too diverse, too divided, uh, and maybe that there are too many differences between European uh, countries for bold ideas of reform to take uh, root, to be viable, or to work. And Miguel today has spoken of uh, uh, ideas that only a short time ago were unthinkable or, or impossible, and uh, today are. Uh, more more plausible. Um, I wanted actually to show uh, something, if I may take a minute, uh, Lorenzo. I think you are co-host, so you can share the screen. Yes. yes. Do I have two minutes? Yes, you do. So this is um, a measure of diversity uh, of European electorates and party systems. This is done over time. It ends in 2015, 16, I don't remember uh, exactly. Uh, and it's 30 European countries. So how, how diverse uh, these countries are in the way in which they, they vote for different party, party families. It's a Gini index uh, that I have standardized and weighted in different, in different ways. And we see that obviously in the 19th century countries were very, very different, but then they seem to become more similar and continue to become increasingly similar. And I wanted to show, just to have a reference, what two other large compound democracies look like. The red line is the United States, so that the diversity between 50 states and how they vote, obviously they have a very different party system. And, uh, and I added also, but for a shorter um, time period, India. And you see that Europe is still a bit more diverse, uh, European electorates between these 30 countries, still a bit more diverse than uh, these, other, uh, these other countries, but not that much more, uh, more uh, diverse. And uh, the other thing I wanted to show so this obviously assumes that Europe is, we imagine that Europe is one, one single country with uh, like 30 uh, lender or cantons or something similar. And this is Europe, the diversity in Europe, this is done with an, un, an other index, the standard deviation across again, these uh, 30 countries compared with the diversity within certain countries, for example, the 26, uh, Swiss cantons or the 20 Italian regions and so on and so, and, and so forth. And we see that Europe is actually less diverse than some of the countries it is uh, made of. So that the diversity within Switzerland, Belgium or Britain and other countries, I didn't list them all, is, uh, is higher than, than for, uh, for uh, Europe. And therefore, to conclude uh, our series, let me stop this. To conclude our series, this small, very small contribution to the debate is to say that maybe the context 
in which we are is not too unfavorable and maybe much more conducive to reform than many policy makers uh, assume. So if the conversations can continue to contribute to the awareness that more is uh, possible and not uh, unthinkable, then I think that uh, the conversation will succeed. Thank you. Okay, and uh, thank you to you, Daniele. Thank you to everyone. So I won't uh, um, make a further contribution to today's conversation. Just to emphasize and my, or to repeat my deep conviction that a democracy at any level, including at the European level, is in the first place a conversation. And that, is, that means uh, that people put ideas forward, other people listen, and then there must be a, a, a discussion of these ideas that must be open, but at the same time not too indulgent. And so uh, today we had a pretty consensual uh, discussion. Uh, we could have made it more controversial, for example, by uh, asking uh, Miguel why wealth tax is not on his list. And then uh, maybe we, we, we would have uh, uh, progressed also uh, on that side. But and that's uh, the idea also then for, for the future of continuing this sort of conversations trying to bridge not only the gender gap, perhaps the, the, gen, the distance between genders that is probably the, the lightest one in this respect, but also the distance between disciplines, which is often difficult, be, between linguistic groups, uh, between nationalities with uh, a different traditions, between generations, and all this is part of what we are trying to do in this modest fashion, but much more broadly in the uh, the conference for the future of Europe and in European so-called European democracy in uh, its many facets. So thank you very much to all and especially to those most directly involved in the running of it. So uh, Sarah, Martina, uh, Lorenzo, uh, Daniele and Bridget for the pioneering role she played in this whole enterprise. So. Bye bye. Have a nice afternoon. And I think uh, with Daniele, Lorenzo and Sarah, we remain a little bit to do a debriefing. Bye bye.